Coming up on Market to Market. After lengthy debate, House lawmakers reject their version of the Farm Bill. Federal authorities crack down on employers of undocumented workers. And the president proposes a massive trade deal with the European Union. Those stories and market analysis with Mark Gold, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success. This is the Friday, June 21 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Noting an improving economic outlook, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke ended weeks of speculation Wednesday, saying the Fed will likely slow its bond buying program later this year and end it in 2014 if the recovery continues. And while that may seem like a positive suggestion, the mere suggestion that the Fed gravy train may be coming to an end roiled markets all over the world. A global sell-off that began in Asia quickly spread to Europe and then the U.S., where the Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 560 points Wednesday and Thursday, wiping out all of its gains during May and June. But the damage wasn't limited solely to stocks. Bond prices also fell, as did commodity prices. Gold and silver plummeted to their lowest levels since 2010. Crude oil had its largest single-day decline since November, and green prices also caved to the bearish sentiment gripping the markets. The question now is whether the plunge was an overreaction or an indication of further volatility in the days ahead. And agricultural traders received a second helping of uncertainty Thursday when House lawmakers rejected the Farm Bill. The yeas are 195, the nays are 234, the bill is not passed. And with that, the U.S. House of Representatives ended a marathon debate over the Farm Bill as a $940 billion overhaul of agriculture and food assistance went down in defeat. Sorting through 103 amendments proved to be an arduous task for the chamber, as alterations to the bill included everything from wildfire protection to growing hemp for research and even eliminating the National Sheep Industry Improvement Center. Ultimately, three amendments may have killed the bill. One adjustment would have placed tighter caps on government crop insurance subsidies, Another created the Dairy Producer Margin Insurance Program. And the most contentious revision would have cut $20 billion in annual funding for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps. SNAP is effectively targeted at our, at our most vulnerable populations, primarily serving children, seniors, and the disabled and poorest communities, people who cannot work. The data doesn't support, on behalf of the taxpayer, that we continue to increase funding for SNAP. And in fact, if you follow the red line here, that's unemployment in America. And you see during the recession, unemployment went up, as did, as did SNAP spending, almost exactly at the same ratio. And then when unemployment, as the economy began to recover, and unemployment went down, as did poverty went down, SNAP funding continued to go up. I am concerned that the rule makes in order several, quite frankly, mean-spirited amendments that do nothing but demonize the poor and make their lives even more difficult. Those who are able-bodied, those who really should be getting up during the day and trying to go find work, uh, do not take government assistance. I tell my colleague from Texas, you want to find money in this budget, go to the crop insurance program, which is ripping off billions of dollars from U.S. taxpayers. That's where the money is, not where the program is to feed our kids. Food stamps are good for the economy. They get resources into the hands of families who will spend them right away. And most importantly, they're the right thing to do. If you qualify on the income and the asset side, you'll stay on the program. If you make too much money, uh, to qualify directly for food stamp, those are the folks that we'll be getting at as part of the $20 billion that, uh, that we'll save in this program. In the end, opposition proved too much for the primary authors of the bill, Republican Frank Lucas of Oklahoma and Democrat Colin Peterson of Minnesota. Sensing he lacked the votes necessary for passage, Lucas made a final impassioned plea to his colleagues. Assess the situation. Look at the bill. Vote with me to move this forward. If you care about the consumers, the producers, the citizens of this country, move this bill forward. Nevertheless, 62 Republicans joined 172 Democrats in voting against the measure. Some said no because the cuts to SNAP were too severe. 
Other detractors felt the legislation didn't cut enough federal spending. Following the vote, the House Ag Committee chairman issued this statement. I'm obviously disappointed, but the reforms in H.R. 1947, $40 billion in deficit reduction, elimination of direct payments, and the first reforms to SNAP since 1996 are so important that we must continue to pursue them. We are assessing all of our options, but I have no doubt that we will finish our work in the near future and provide the certainty that our farmers, ranchers, and rural constituents need. Even if the Farm Bill had passed, it would have faced an uncertain future, since it would have needed to be reconciled with the Senate version to avoid a presidential veto. The House's rejection of the Farm Bill could signal a shift in the way Congress views agricultural policy. For decades, lawmakers on agriculture committees have included nutritional programs in farm bills to garner urban votes. But that marriage has made passage harder this time around. And lawmakers have suggested separating farm and nutritional programs into separate bills. In the wake of the defeat, the House could push for an extension of the 2008 Farm Bill or negotiate another measure with the Senate and try again. The Senate, you'll recall, approved its version of the Farm Bill last week and moved on to the even thornier issue of immigration reform. This week, however, federal authorities busted an operation circumventing current immigration laws. But it wasn't the undocumented workers who were arrested. It was their employers. In what has been called the largest criminal immigrant employment investigation ever conducted in the U.S., nine owners and managers of 7-Eleven convenience stores located in New York and Virginia were arrested this week on charges of wire fraud conspiracy, aggravated identity theft, and concealing and harboring illegal aliens. The franchise owners that we have charged were engaged in a pattern of fraud and worker exploitation that involved stolen identities, false information submitted to their payroll provider, and the systematic exploitation of the mostly illegal immigrant workforce that they sought out and that they employed. Described by officials as a modern-day plantation system, the scheme allegedly cheated undocumented workers from Pakistan and the Philippines out of 75 percent of their wages. The resulting $182 million in profits were shared by the defendants in 7-Eleven. Immigrant workers were routinely forced, upon threat of job loss or deportation, to work upwards of 100 hours a week, to live only in the houses the defendants owned, and were given only a small percentage of the money they earned. The federal indictment alleges that since 2000, store owners employed more than 50 immigrants who did not have permission to be in the U.S. Victims of identity theft used to conceal workers' true identities include a child, three deceased people, and a U.S. Coast Guard cadet. A spokesman for Dallas-based 7-Eleven pledged full cooperation with the federal probe and said the company will take aggressive actions to audit the employment status of all its franchisees' employees. Federal officials also executed search warrants at more than 40 other stores across the country suspected of similar infractions. We just got a phone call that he's arrested, and we don't know the reasoning behind it, but hopefully we find out soon. Authorities say the case came to light due to undocumented workers who, despite their legal status, blew the whistle on their boss's dubious employment practices. In the nation's capital, the plight of illegal aliens remains a thorny issue as the ongoing push for immigration reform moves in fits and starts. Analysis by the Congressional Budget Office this week concluded the Senate proposal would only tamp down illegal immigration 25 percent. Critics claim new programs in the bill allow temporary workers who could easily abuse the privilege by overstaying their visas. Proponents of the Senate effort latched onto another key finding by the CBO this week that said immigration reform would boost the economy and reduce federal deficits by billions of dollars. Both sides of the aisle remain at odds on the issue, though some in the Obama administration view agriculture as playing a key role in bringing lawmakers back to the negotiating table. Giving agriculture a stable workforce and complementing it with a, a guest worker system that is less bureaucratic, less cumbersome, and is administered by the USDA uh, is also part of its comprehensive immigration reform bill, uh, which will also provide an assurance that there will always be sufficient uh, folks to work on our fields, in our ranches, on our farms. President Obama traveled to Northern Ireland this week for meetings with the leaders of the world's largest economies. The goal of the G8 summit was to encourage cooperation and transparency on trade and taxes. 
But the president and his Russian Federation counterpart, Vladimir Putin, also found time to discuss what they called different perspectives on the conflict in Syria. In its culminating declaration, the G8 said authorities across the world should automatically share information to fight the scourge of tax evasion. The big news from the summit, however, came early in the week when President Obama called for a significant trade deal with the European Union. The largest bilateral trade agreement in history was proposed this week in Enniskill in Ireland during the G8 summit. U.S. and European Union members agreed to open negotiations on a broad trade deal that would slash tariffs and other barriers that restrict exports and competition. And this potentially groundbreaking partnership would deepen those ties. It would increase exports, decrease barriers to trade and investment. As part of broader growth strategies in both our economies, it would support hundreds of thousands of jobs on both sides of the ocean. We're talking about what could be the biggest bilateral trade deal in history. Known as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, the pact would unite the world's two mightiest economic regions in an agreement affecting more than 800 million people. G8 leaders rejected efforts to protect domestic markets and urged driving forward free trade under the central role of the World Trade Organization. At stake is a vision of boosting the value of transatlantic trade, which already accounts for about half of global gross domestic product. According to the Obama administration, trade between the two economies already exceeds $1 trillion annually, amounts to $4 trillion in annual investments, and is responsible for 13 million jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. If ratified, TTIP is expected to boost the economies of the United States and the 27 member nations of the European Union by $300 billion annually and create 2 million jobs. Obama predicted the parties involved would need to overcome sensitivities. While leaders would be giving strong mandates to their negotiators, Obama said he suspected the leaders themselves would need to intervene at certain points to work through hang-ups. Later in the week, President Obama and Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel held a joint press conference to further promote TTIP. Of our relationships, uh, we will throw our effort behind this fully and squarely because we think that economies on both sides of the Atlantic will very much benefit from that. It's going to be a win-win situation and it also is an eloquent testimony to this globalized world where we can work better together, um, both politically and economically. So this is why I think this is in a very, very important free trade agreement and I say this on behalf of the federal government as a whole. From our perspective, uh, the relationship uh, with Europe remains the cornerstone of our freedom and our security. Uh, that uh, Europe is our partner uh, in almost everything that we do. Uh, and that although the nature of the challenges we face have changed, uh, the strength of our relationships, uh, the enduring bonds based on common values and common ideals, uh, very much remains. Some protesters did gather near the Irish town of 15,000, but far fewer than were expected, and no arrests were reported. According to the White House, the trade proposal was well received by Congress and the U.S. business community. In response to the announcement, officials with the American Farm Bureau said they were cautiously hopeful that negotiations would yield positive results for U.S. agriculture. American Farm Bureau President Bob Stallman said the planned talks hold promise. And the National Pork Producers Council urged the Obama administration to press the European Union to negotiate a comprehensive free trade agreement. According to the White House, EU-U.S. talks could start as early as next month. Both sides hope to reach an agreement by late 2014. Next, the Market to Market Report. Grain prices were pressured by the global equity and commodity sell-off late this week, but not enough to offset gains in earlier sessions. For the week, July wheat gained 17 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved about 7 cents higher. Soybeans, however, endured another losing week as the July contract declined by 23 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with a loss of $3 per ton. In the softs, cotton gave back all of last week's gains and then some, as the December contract posted a weekly loss of nearly $5 per hundredweight. In the dairy market, July Class 3 milk lost 28 cents, while the August contract declined by 27. Over in livestock, the August cattle contract gained $3.28. 
August feeders advanced by $3.50, and the July lean hog contract posted a weekly gain of $1.73. In the financials, the euro lost 206 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil declined by 438 per barrel. Comex Gold lost nearly $100 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index moved more than 20 points lower to settle at 610.55. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Mark Gold. Mark, welcome back. Thanks, Mike. Nice to be here. Glad to have you. The big news this week, obviously, uh, Ben Bernanke and the Federal Reserve, the FOMAC minutes. Talk to us a little bit about your anticipation as to what effect this global equity sell-off is going to have on the commodities as we look forward. Well, one of the things that we're going to see is, as some of these other markets get hit, the bond market took a big hit, crude oil, gold, silver, a lot of commodities across the board. It's going to create margin calls, which could create more pressure on, on the grains. Uh, Long-term, higher interest rates in the lower stock market, I don't think is going to necessarily be helpful for the, for the grain markets. More importantly, the effect of the U.S. dollar. We've seen the Australian dollar break significantly. The Brazilian real break significantly against the dollar. And that's going to give our competitors a bit of advantage with those cheaper prices out here. So I think, you know, between the, the inflationary aspect of the interest rates moving higher and maybe the economy getting a little bit weaker here, I'm not sure it's friendly to the grain markets. Now, one thing we've talked about on the show for the past several weeks has been the fact that there just hasn't been any interest in managed money in the commodities due to the the returns they're able to get on the stock market. Would this shift potentially encourage more uh, managed or fund money to look at commodities as an investment? You know, honestly, I don't see that. As a matter of fact, we see the exact opposite. There was an announcement today that uh, one of the big commodity firms was going to be backing out of their commodity trading activities. Uh, we've seen managed money getting tougher and tougher to come into these markets. These funds have taken, some of them have taken a pretty big hit in these markets. And these, the volatility that we've seen, when the dollar goes from 84 to 80, back to 84, back to 80, back to 82 and a half, when you see crude oil go from 93 to 98, back to 93, and gold taking the devastating drop it's taken, silver's back under $20 an ounce for the first time in three years, gold's under $1,300 an ounce for the last time in three years. So these funds have taken a beating, and I think it's going to be tougher and tougher to get that money back into these markets. Sit on the sidelines and, and lick wounds for a little bit. I think so. All right. Well, now let's talk about the wheat market. We did see uh, a little jump in wheat prices on the week. Talk to us a little bit about what's going on there. Well, I think there's two factors. First of all, the trade got excited on Thursday because there was an announcement that China bought 200,000 metric tons of French wheat. I didn't particularly think that was that friendly for the U.S., but we rallied uh, 20 to 25 cents across the board in the wheat on the thoughts that China may be back in the market for more wheat. Until we actually see them buy U.S. wheat, I don't know if I'd get too crazy excited about the bull side of it, but it helped. The other problem with the wheat market is the yields in Kansas, some very spotty yields. We've seen some of the early tour results coming in at 40 and 50 bushel wheat with good test weights. We're hearing other stories of 10 to 20 bushel wheat in Kansas. So the hard wheat is having some troubles. The soft wheat looks phenomenal, and the yields could be very, very impressive, particularly east of the Mississippi. Illinois, Ohio, Indiana could have some really big soft yields. Combine that with larger crops, we're looking at a 38% increase in Russia, about a 25% increase in Ukraine. Uh, Australia's crop looks to be up around you know, 15 to 20%. So we're going to have plenty of competition. There's going to be a lot of exportable grain out there. So I'm just not sure that we're going to be able to sustain this as we move forward. But if anything, I'd probably want to be long Kansas City and maybe short Chicago in here. All right. And until we get some confirmation, until harvest starts rolling and we see the numbers coming out of the fields. Yeah, that's been the impressive thing. We've had this ability to rally right in the middle of harvest. uh, So that's a little bit friendly. Uh, My advice to my clients has been if you're selling wheat off the combine, buy back some call options. I wouldn't buy the calls back in Chicago. I'd buy the calls back in Kansas City. Even if you're selling soft wheat, I'd buy back the hard wheat calls. But I think that makes some sense to try to reown it at these levels and see if we can't get a bounce out of it. Certainly. Now let's take a look at corn. Uh, As we look at that, the old crop corn situation, uh, we do have the USDA stocks report coming up next week. Talk to us a little bit about what to anticipate in this upcoming week, old crop wise. Well, old crop, you know, we know how tight we are. We look at the basis here in Iowa, 50, 60, 70 over for old crop. Guys are having a tough time sourcing grain out here. We know old crop stocks are incredibly tight. That being said, 
We've had a gap in the July corn chart at 676 since the March 28th report. We went up and filled that gap, I think it was on Wednesday, but then closed well under it on Friday. So I'm not sure that's necessarily a friendly signal to go up, close into the gap, close over it, and then come right back under it again. But it's really the old crop July situation is going to be a function of that stocks report at the end of the month. Most people believe that we're tight. I believe we are tight. But the market hasn't really had that explosive energy that you would think you might see as we're getting closer and closer to running out of these stocks. All right. So it might be a wait and see come the end of next week. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as you look at new crop, what's your anticipation there? My anticipation on new crop is we're growing a lot of grain in this country. Yes, some of the crop got in late. Yes, uh, we may have missed some of the optimal sun rays. We're now at the solstice as of this weekend, and we're going to be seeing a decrease in sunlight. And people want to keep telling me, every agronomy report I see, a lot of the farmers keep telling me, we can't not be growing big yields with how late the crop went in and with the problem now that we're on kind of the back end of the sunlight. I would disagree. I believe we're still capable in this country of growing a huge, huge corn crop. And when it's all said and done, yes, there are going to be some places that are going to be tough. Parts in Iowa here, parts in Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin are going to be tough. But the weather over the, the July forecast now that the government just put out shows the southwest being hot and dry, the rest of the country in pretty normal shape. If we can grow 125 bushel corn in the worst drought in U.S. history, can we grow 165 bushel corn even though it's late? In my opinion, we can. So now might be a good time to look at some sales. Not only looking at some sales, you know, we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves until maybe after July 1st. Take a look at your crops. If you've got the crops out there July 1st, then you certainly want to be looking at some sales or at least getting some put options underneath to protect that downside. All right. Well, now let's take a look at soybeans. We've been on a, a two-week slide on beans. Where do you see this headed? Well, people want to tell me, and I don't necessarily disagree, that the real tightness is in the old crop bean situation. There's been a key number at 1525 in the July contract. Had a lot of trouble getting over it. We closed over it a couple of days, then right back under it, closed under $15 on Friday. We couldn't even get the July contract to close at $15 as the options went off the board. Normally, they try to get them to, the puts and calls to expire worthless, and $15 was that benchmark. They couldn't do it. We closed under that. If we start closing under where we closed on Friday again, it's telling me that maybe things aren't as tight as some people would say they are. I'm a firm proponent and that if this old crop grain, corn and beans, isn't any good, the new crop makes it tougher. And one of the things we've seen in both corn and beans has been the funds roll out of the July contracts into the new crop now. So now they've moved those long positions. I've been telling my clients that we firmly believe that every one of these rallies that we've seen on these rolls, with corn at 550, 560, 570, with new crop beans at 13, 1320, has been a great marketing opportunity to get something sold, to get cheap, cheaper puts bought, to do something. Because now these funds are along the new crop. If we have the crop, there's a lot of risk to the downside, in my opinion. All right, take advantage of these little rallies as, as they come. Absolutely. Now, let's take a look at, uh, in the livestock market, particularly in cattle. It's been a long time since we've had good news to talk about in cattle. This week, we did see a little bit of a rise. Where do you see us headed in the fat market? Well, we've been struggling. We keep ratcheting down and making lower lows. We try to rally it, only to make another new low. We've held a low here now for the last several weeks. We tried to test it again early in the week as the cash prices were down around 120 in that area. We were able to move it today significantly and even above the trend line of both the feeder cattle and the fat cattle. So even though the report on Friday wasn't necessarily friendly, it was maybe a little bit skewed to the bearish side. If we can close strong Monday, considering what's happening in the grains, considering what's happening in the stock market, if we can do that, I'd... I like this cattle market a little bit in here, as long as we hold the lows. And a strong close, you'd be looking at above 120 and a half, 121? One, over 121, okay. I think, would be a good benchmark in here. And regardless of where we're closing, we're on such a hard break on this cattle right now. If you are selling cattle, I'd certainly look at reowning some call options. 
you know, spend a buck, a buck and a half, try to keep the upside open in case we can get a six, seven, eight dollar rally out of this thing and maybe turn this thing around, hopefully. Hopefully. And now as we take a look at the feeder cattle market, we, we did see uh, lower corn prices being a little bit supportive of that. And now we've got a, hopefully a little better returns on the fat market. What, what's your thoughts on feeders? Same thing on the feeders. We've been under pressure. We keep trying that 150 level has been kind of a key level uh, across the board. We had a good close on Friday. Again, over the trend lines, we've been trying to establish those lows. We've been able to hold it this time and to close over that trend line. So if, again, if we can get another good Monday close with everything else that's going on in the world, I would say that's pretty positive. Now, how long lasting do you see a rally like this being? You mentioned touching the highs, then dropping to lower lows. Is that a risk here in this little rally? It has been over the last six months, every one of these rallies, we have seen the new lows. But this is the first time we've been able to really take out the trend line. So that encourages me in here. The high hog prices also gives me some encouragement. We're seeing good Chinese demand on the hog side, Smithfields, the sale of Smithfields. That's really, in my opinion, what was the impetus to put July hogs up around 100 bucks. We're having all kinds of trouble and have over the last six months of getting into close over 101 in that area. We made a new contract high, backed off. But my point here is that you've got high-priced pork, and what's your preference? Buying cattle at 120 or buying hogs at 101? Well, I know a lot of people that would prefer the beef at that kind of price relationship. So I'm just not sure. Yes, there's a lot of long-term demand from the Chinese on the pork market. But the beef market, you know, I kind of like it on these lows in here. All right, and now quick update on the pork market. You said that 101 is that... Within striking distance? You know, that's really critical on this July contract. We've gone up there and tried to do it at two different time frames now over a broad period of time. If we can close over that 101 a couple of days in a row, then I'd say we've got a little bit of potential to maybe run it up to 110. All right, things to look for. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Mike. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But if you'd like more information from Mark on where these markets just may be headed, visit the Market Plus page at our website. You'll find expanded market analysis, audio podcasts, and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed and Facebook account, all free at the Market to Market website. Be sure to join us again next week when we'll examine the market impact of USDA's acreage report. So until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success.